this is Bath, it's in southwest England. Uh, this demonstrates, this place demonstrates the power and the reach of the Roman Empire. The Romans built this in AD 70. The nine tons of lead that they lined this pool with is still there. This is 2,000 kilometers from Rome. Imagine an empire that stretched across the known world at that point. At the same time these were being built, there was a small group of people who started following a prophet. He came from a backwater place called Nazareth. And these weren't a powerful group. They were a relatively small group of people who sought to follow this Jesus of Nazareth. They became known as Christians. A uh, very small group and with no power at all. If, if you were to kind of guess who was going to last the longest, the Roman Empire or these Christians, who would you have thought? In 500 years, the Roman Empire had been destroyed. And 2,000 years later, there are 2.1 billion people across the world who call themselves Christians, adhere to the person of Jesus. And Rome is now just a subject of history. So how did that happen? How did this person have such influence? How did the followers of Jesus become such a influential group of people? Why did the life and teaching of Jesus become such a game changer? Now today, the, the the joke is, you know, Jesus was a little thing in his time and Nero was a big deal. Today, Jesus is a big deal and Nero is what you call your dog. You know, <laughs> tells you how things have reversed. Why is he so significant in people's lives? I and mean, one of the archetypal stories in the New Testament was about a guy who started off, his name was Saul and became Paul. And many people know he was actually throwing Christians into prison. And he was on his way to Damascus and he had this remarkable experience. I mean, God just changed his life. And it wasn't just that he decided to follow Jesus. He became this missionary that changed the known world. Everybody has to ask the question, why such a significant influence? Why was Jesus a game changer in Paul's life? And it's not just that it happened to Paul, it's been happening time and time and time again. Millions of people over 2,000 years have had their lives revolutionized by Jesus. I, I was transformed. I come from a tobacco family, not a Christian family at all. My godfather gets killed in a cliff fall when I'm 16 years old. No one has an answer to death. No one's spoken to me about death. A maths teacher says, when Christ rose from the dead, he rose to get you through death. I'm going, well, if that's true, it's the most important thing in the world. And I'm, I, I'm changed at that point. I've buried nine of my school friends. What do you do when you stand at the grave of a school friend? Well, you've got one thing to say. In Christ, there's hope. You can see this person again if they've trusted in Jesus. Well, that changes the world because life's very brief. My connection to Christianity came as a result of a band director, a high school band director that I viewed kind of like another father of mine. You know, he was, I, I'm a musician, I was in the band and I ended up teaching band in the public schools. So um, he actually, in my senior year, um, gave me a Bible and said, Mary Jo, when you go off to college, you're going to have some hard questions, and I hope you'll turn to this. And that was the extent of it. And at that moment in my life, I had some very tough questions, like, is this all there is? Am I really just a collection of atoms in a vast and different universe? Because that's what I'd learned, yeah. and that's my upbringing. So did you start reading it? I did start reading it. Uh, reading through that Bible, brought me around to belief in God. Um, it didn't get me all the way to Jesus though. So what did get you there? Well, I went off to college um, on my own for the, you know, and, and without, you know, my family nearby, I moved halfway across the United States to go to school. And I thought, you know what, this is my chance to go and figure out what this church thing is all about and uh, what people have to say about belief in God. And so I started going to churches on my own. And it was when I finally got to a church where I heard um, what Christians would say is the good news, where I heard and understood my position as being in need of a Savior. And once I understood what Jesus did for me, once I understood that He was the Savior, that's when I trusted in Him uh, for my own salvation. 
um, the old questions, the real questions of philosophy. Who are we? Where has the universe come from? Where are we going? What can we hope for? What significance do our lives have? What is right and wrong? Where do these things come from? What is the best explanation, the best worldview or the best story that makes sense of the answers that we search out in these sorts of discussions? Now, you're, you're obviously you've dismissed Christian faith and you're pursuing this from a, a, a university setting philosophical position. What, what's the way to navigate through those questions? Because they're huge questions. So I was the undergraduate president of the Philosophy Society at the university and I was exploring and thinking about Christian faith and I began to read and think about the arguments for the existence of God and I began to be impacted by these arguments. I would have described myself at that point as being atheist, naturalist, Buddhist kind of leaning mm -hmm. and I began to be impacted and I sat back a couple of times and said to myself these arguments are actually quite intriguing. I can't write off religious believers as being unintelligent anymore. I've got to recognize that some of these arguments actually are quite interesting and quite stimulating and are worthy of a lot more investigation. Was it something that you were drawn to? Because I would imagine uh, in that setting with the life that you'd lived that would have been something you would have pushed against. I mean, it, it, was it difficult to grapple with those questions? My parents, who I didn't get on with, had become Christians when I was in my mid to early teens. Okay. And because they were Christians, and because we didn't get on, I really didn't want it to be true. <laughs> I really didn't want it to be true. It was the last thing I wanted to be true. Intellectually interesting to me, but it was also a personal search, a personal journey. And I eventually, a few months later, got to the point where I said, not only do I think this is true, but I also need help here. And so I knelt down in my room and I held out my hands and I just said, God, I'm not clean. I need you to clean me and help me. Will you forgive me? I want to know you. And that was the last night that I smoked drugs. That was the last night that I smoked a cigarette. That was the last night that I got drunk. As C.S. Lewis says, he gets into a sidecar in Oxford, not a Christian. He gets out of the sidecar in London, a Christian. I'm a bit the same. Uh, th there, was a, there was a change, a, a strange warming of my heart, I think is the way John or Charles Wesley describes the same type of thing. It, it's God's grace and conversion, as Paul describes. It's an act of God. In my case, um, yeah, I, I, this was I probably maybe three months after this process had started, and we were going to church uh, on Christmas Day, as it turned out. And uh, there I was, and we'd been through all of this discussion and I'd been thinking about these things uh, and uh, John was preaching he preached about Jesus as prophet priest and king and the three gifts and all of that uh, and then there was a call to communion this was an Anglican church which uh, I insisted on because I went to an Anglican school and uh, there was a call to communion and as people went up I'd never taken communion prior to that time in fact I didn't take it at school either I just didn't think it was right since I didn't believe or understand what was going on. But now I'd, I'd been through this and it was a call to communion. I didn't go up for a while. And then I looked and I saw people gathering at the front of the church and I saw John there ministering and I thought, hmm, what do you know? Hmm? It's actually true. So I got up and I went forward and uh, I kneeled at the rail and John came along, of course, and he saw me there. He offered me the bread and offered me the wine, and I went back to my seat. And immediately after the service, he came down and he said, you took communion today. And I said, that's right, I did. He said, why? And I said, because it's true. Why couldn't God have just wiped the slate clean? Why the cross? Because justice matters. You see, how I treat you matters to God, and how you treat me matters to God, and how we treat the world matters to God. That's why it's a great thing there's a judgment to come. It's a great thing there's a judgment to come because people have been profoundly hurt. And we look to judgment day for justice to happen. And that goes right through history. There might be people listening now and they're, they're saying, you know, they're victims as well as rebels in God's world. They're victims. They've had something terrible happen. I'm saying it matters to God. There'll be a day of judgment. 
But on that day of judgment, who pays for sin? Either I can pay myself in a place called hell, and Jesus is the theologian of hell, the most loving man that ever lived, he speaks again and again of hell, or I can allow Jesus to pay as he dies on the cross. So justice matters, sin must be paid for, you can pay for yourself in hell, or you can allow Jesus to pay, but he pays by dying on the cross. So what should someone do? Well, the first thing you've got to do, and can I say this will be very important for all your relationships, not just with the Lord, but others, is you've got to accept that in God's world, you've rebelled against him. You've got to accept that you have not lived as you should in his world. And that might mean you've made good things God things, like the kids or their education or the career, but you've taken the gifts of God, you've put God on one side, and you've lived your own way. So you've got to accept you've sinned. Secondly, you've got to believe that Christ died for you. That when he died on the cross, he died for you in your place. It's an amazing thing. The cross isn't just, as I say, this Galilean, Galilean carpenter dying. Thirdly, you've got to count the cost, which is lovely. It's wonderful to count the cost, because it means that you're for what Jesus is for, you're against what he's against. Jesus died for you, look at his life, it's a perfect life, can't you trust him to lead you? So you count the cost, that'll mean turning away from stuff, but everything he calls you to turn away from you is not beneficial, he knows what's best. And then lastly, you say, having accepted you've sinned, believe Christ died for you, counted the cost, lastly you say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. I'm so sorry for my wrongdoing. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit and be my Lord and Master. So it's an amazing thing that we can say a prayer because all the work has been done by Jesus. So if I link up with God, he lives forever and I'll live forever, this piece of dust, I'll live forever because I'm linked up with God through what Jesus has done. Now for me, can I tell you, that's a total game changer because it gives me eternity.